that as we look at the book of Proverbs, we cannot divorce it from Jesus himself. That as we think about Proverbs, it points forward to Jesus, the one who is our Messiah, the one who ultimately is our wisdom. And so we've seen that Jesus himself is the true wisdom that we must all seek. It's not just about following a bunch of rules. It's not just about following a bunch of good advice. But in the end, it is about following Jesus. And we're going to continue to see that throughout these chapters as we look at the book of Proverbs. And today we will see that as well. So today, what we're going to look at as we've been thinking about seeking wisdom, that Jesus is the one we need to seek if we are to seek wisdom. Today we're going to look at as a chapter 3 breaks in, it's been talking to us a lot about the value of wisdom and what wisdom looks like. And now in chapter 3, we're going to take it apart and we're going to see what are the acts of wisdom and how does it, what, what is it? What are the reasons that we should seek the wisdom of Christ? What are the reasons? It's actually okay to have reasons. It's okay. Uh, the Bible is full of, hey, if you follow God, this is the good things that will follow. And that's what we see here in Proverbs chapter 3. We're actually going to see a little bit of a, a structure where you're going to see a command and then you're going to see a promise. A command, promise. A command, promise. It's the idea of doing wisdom, acting on wisdom, following Jesus will then result in a promise. Uh, it's almost as a, as a father wants to teach, uh, and this is appropriate as we're going to look at chapter 3, it starts off by again uh, this idea of a father speaking to a son. And the idea here is the re there's reasons that we've set up these, these rules or these pieces of advice. It's not just arbitrary. There are reasons why you should follow the wisdom of Christ. And it's okay to look at those reasons and then to dive into those reasons and say it's worth following godly wisdom, it's worth following Jesus, and that's what we're going to look at today. Ultimately, all these promises are going to fulfill something that all of us seek. And so we're going to talk a lot about what are you seeking? What is it that you're looking for? What is it that you are striving to find in life? You know, we are uh, a couple of days away from celebrating uh, Independence Day, July 4th, and, you know, back in, seven, in the 1770s, what was wanted, what was sought after was freedom. And, and through the Declaration of Independence and the following Revolutionary War, our forefathers fought for and sought to have freedom. But it wasn't just that they sought freedom, then they had to actually put work into it. And if they did what they needed to do, then they would find freedom. But they didn't just sit back and say, we want to be free, but we see that they made steps of following what would make sense if they wanted to pursue and seek freedom. A lot of people have pursued and sought a lot of things in life. I think about treasure hunters as they, they seek treasure and they're willing to spend whatever it takes to get the right boat, to get the right diving equipment if they're going out into the ocean to find treasure and they'll, if they're, what they're seeking is what controls them. What they're seeking is what controls them and then the point is, though, if you seek something, how are you going to find it? And today what I want to talk about as we look at Proverbs chapter 3 is that whatever you're seeking today, whatever you find yourself seeking, and, and uh, of course we all know as we looked at the book of Matthew not too long ago that we should all be seeking first the kingdom of God, and that is very true. But as humans, there are things in our hearts and in our lives that we desire that we are seeking to find in this life. But what I want us to see today is that if you want to find whatever that is, you can only find that in Jesus. There is only one way to find anything your heart desires can be found in Jesus. It can be found in the wisdom that God supplies, which is Jesus himself. So now that I've told you where we're going, I already got the conclusion figured out. We're going to, get, we're going to now take some time to look at this proverb and get us to that conclusion where we can have some discussions about what is it that you're seeking and how can we find it in Jesus? And so we're going to start uh, very simply by reading Proverbs chapter 3, verses 1 through 12. Uh, this is not on the screen. You'll have to follow along. Uh, Proverbs 3, 1 through 12. My son, do not forget my teaching, but let your heart keep my commandments. For length of days and years of life and peace they will add to you. Let not steadfast love and faithfulness forsake you. Bind them around your neck. Write them on the tablet of your heart so you will find favor and good success in the sight of God and man. 
Trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not lean into your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge Him and He will make straight your paths. Do not be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and turn away from evil. It will be healing to your flesh and refreshment to your bones. Honor the Lord with your wealth and the first fruits of all your produce. Then your barns will be filled with plenty and your vats be bursting with wine. My son, do not despise the Lord's discipline or be weary of His reproof. For the Lord reproves him who He loves as a father the son in whom He delights. So this is what we see in Proverbs chapter 3, verses 1-12. through 12. So what we're going to look at is we're going to, there's, there's couplets here. There's parallel statements. There's going, as I said earlier, there's going to be a command followed by a promise. In other words, if you do this to follow wisdom, then this is what will happen. And we're going to look at that. And we're going to talk about what that looks like. Uh, and so we're going to start, and each one of these couplets, I'm going to then go to the New Testament, read a passage of Scripture that will help us understand this even more. And so we're going to start with verses 1 and 2. And we start... Uh, son, uh, father to a son, my son, do not forget my teaching, but let your heart keep my commandments. For length of days and years of life and peace, they will add to you. So our first point today is this. Listening to God leads to a long, peaceful life. That's what it says. Now here, it's the, it's the author writing to his son, but we also understand even later in this passage that God is referred to as a father. And so we understand that even as a, uh, <clears throat> as a Hebrew family, what is it that they would have been teaching what is it that the commandments that they have been giving well, it would have all been founded on the law of God? And it would have all been founded on God's word. And so really what the point here is not just, hey, listen to your dad. The point is listen to the fa- your father God. Listen to God's word. And so if we listen to God, take heed to his teachings, follow his commandments, then what it says is length of days and years of life and peace they will add to you. Now, Let's talk about peace for a moment. This word peace really is talking, it's shalom. It's talking about a completeness. It's to be fulfilled. It's to know and feel and know that you are fulfilled in life. And that is what is promised here to those who listen to God's word. It doesn't mean that there's never going to be strife. It doesn't mean that there's never going to be conflict. That's not the type of peace we're looking at. This is the type of peace that overwhelms you to the point where you feel fulfilled and complete no matter what may come. And so we want to make sure that that is very clear. Length of days and years of life we're going to talk about in a moment, but this is not always a formula. There are some people who have listened to God. I, I, I uh, went to camp with a, with a man who I would say was one of the most uh, spiritual, God-oriented, God's Word-oriented. He had memorized three-quarters of the Bible, and he was everywhere he went, he was telling people about Jesus, And when he was 26 years old, he was in a state park, fell off a cliff, and ended up dying. So, is this proverb wrong in that point? Well, we're going to look at it in a moment as we look to the New Testament. But as we look about this length of life, as we think about this, and and the days of life, the years of life that will come, it's more than just how we view life. It's not just the physical life that we have, but it's so much greater. And I believe we see that in Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8, verses 1 through 11. We're going to be looking at a lot of Scripture this morning to compare New Testament to Old Testament to show how all the Bible comes together. But let's look at Romans 8, 1 through 11. This is a lot of people's very favorite chapter of the, of the Bible, and so many of you will already know this, but let's read this. There is therefore no, now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the Spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. For God has done what the law weakened by the flesh could not do. By sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, he condemned sin in the flesh. In order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us, who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who live according to the Spirit set their minds on the things of the Spirit. And watch this in verse 6. For to set the mind on the flesh is death, but to set the mind on the Spirit is life and peace. That should remind us of Proverbs 3. For the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God, for it does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. You, however, are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. If, the, if, the fact, if in fact, the Spirit of God dwells in you, anyone who does not have the Spirit of Christ does not belong to him. But if Christ is in you, although the body is dead because of, the, because of sin, the Spirit is life because of righteousness. If the Spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also... Give life to your mortal bodies through His Spirit who dwells in you. 
Romans 8 makes it very clear that our fleshly, physical view of life is not what God has in mind when he looks at what a quality life is all about. As we look at the proverb, that's what this is about. You will have quality of life if you follow God's word, if you follow Jesus, if you follow the wisdom that Jesus gives, then you indeed will have a fulfilled life, a peaceful, a full life. That is what is seen here. It's seen in Romans chapter 8 as well. Notice it says that those who set their mind on the flesh, on the sinful way of living, on the way the world operates, they will, they will only experience death. But if we set the mind on the spirit that is given to us through Jesus, Jesus died, rose again, gave us the Holy Spirit so that we'd have him with us forever, then we can experience what Romans 8 calls life and peace. Even if our physical life is taken, we can experience true life to the fullest. That is what Romans 8 promises us. That is what Proverbs 3 tells us. Let's go to the next couplet here in Proverbs chapter 3. Uh, So we're looking now at verses 3 and 4. Let not steadfast love and faithfulness forsake you. Bind them around your neck. Write them on the tablet of your heart. For you will find favor, so you will find favor and good success in the sight of God and in the sight of God man. All right, so here's our point from this, is commitment to God leads to grace and success. But again, just as if we, just as we had to talk about with the first point, is let's think about what this really is all about. What is the essence of grace? The word favor here is the same word we would use for grace in our New Testament, and grace is unmerited favor. It's God giving good to those who only deserve bad. Listen, this is God's grace that isn't, it's not something we earn, it's something that is given. However, in this sense, what we're seeing is, if you will commit to a covenant with God, which is, all these words are very covenant laden. Uh, love and faithfulness, don't let, steadfast love, that's said. that's that love that only really God shows to people, and to bind them around your neck, write them on the tablet of your heart. These are all covenantal sayings. They're found in the Old Testament, and in, or in the Old Covenant, and in the New Covenant. We see it to be true that there is a covenant being made with God, a commitment that is made. And as you commit to God, as you are in a covenant relationship with Him, then grace will flow over you. His unmerited favor will flow over you. And so that will happen. And there will also be success. The success in the eyes of God and man, we're told. And and again, let's not define success according to the way world defines success. Success is not having enough money to be set for life. Success is not being the top of the pyramid. Success is a faithful life lived for God that leaves you with no regrets. That is success. And, Roman, and Titus 3 is where I want to go in the New Testament to back this statement up in Proverbs 3. So Titus 3, verses 3 through 8. I want to highlight a couple things as we read this. But Titus 3, 3 through 8. For we ourselves were once foolish, disobedient, led astray, slaves to various passions and pleasures, passing our days in malice and envy, hated by others and hating one another. But when the goodness and loving kindness of God our Savior appeared, he saved us not because of works done in righteousness, but because of his own mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us richly through Jesus Christ our Savior, so that being justified by his grace, we might become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. The saying is, this saying is trustworthy, and I want to insist on these things so that those who have believed in God may be careful to devote themselves to good works. These things are excellent and profitable for people. As you see the italicized words here in these verses, as I've added those in, we look at this idea that God has given us grace, His goodness and His loving kindness and His grace has been poured out upon us. And as that happens, the part that then we see at the end here is what happens when this happens, when God gives us grace, his goodness and kindness overwhelms us, then we will be devoted to good works because... So here's the idea. We're talking about commitment to God brings grace and success. So we are devoted to God. We are devoted to doing what he wants to do. And as that happens we see that these things are excellent and profitable. If that's not what success is, I don't know what else is. It's excellence and being profitable. But again, not profitable in the world sense, not making money, but profitable for people, to build people up, to make people know God, to show God to people. That is the excellent and profitable things that will happen as we devote ourselves to God, as he showers us with grace and goodness and loving kindness. And so we, it's a covenant there. We see God's grace on one end, our response on the other end, as, as Pastor Justin did so great last week with the rubber band. 
You know, it's that tension again of saying God has given us grace, and yet in that grace, we then need to commit ourselves to Him. It's a both-and relationship as we see that. And we see that in Titus chapter 3, that we've been given grace, and then we devote ourselves. And those things are excellent and profitable. On, our, on the outline, I also put Ephesians 2, 8 through 10. Many of you will know that. For by grace we've been saved through faith, and not of ourselves, it is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. But we are... We are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus so that we may do good works. That same idea is there. Grace is poured out on us and then we go forward and do good. And that good is profitable and successful. And so if you want to see success, true success in life, it's by committing yourself to God. As we go back to Proverbs chapter 3, let's look at the next couple of verses as we see the next couplet. And as we see this, this is one of the most famous verses in all of Scripture. Let's look at 3, 5, and 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge Him and He will make straight your paths. So what do we see from this? We see that trusting in God leads to straight paths. I know that's earth-shaking there. I I really went out of the way to, to twist that to figure something out. No, trusting in God leads to straight paths. If you want a life in which you have purpose and if a life in which you can walk in a straight path, Isn't that all what we want? We want the path of least resistance in some ways. It's not that we won't receive resistance from the world, but if we are walking in God's ways, if we are trusting in God, trusting that whatever path we're on is God's path for us, then we can walk through this life. We can trust in Him with all of our heart, not just partially, but fully, and not lean on our own understanding, not think, well, this has to be the wrong path because it doesn't look the way I want it to. No, it's to say, I'm on this path. I'm going to trust God to see me through It's to trust Him with all of our heart and then in all our ways acknowledge Him. No matter where we're going, that we know God, that that is our goal, is to know Jesus better. That is the acknowledge word is not in this, in the Hebrew here, it's it's not about acknowledging just by saying, well, whatever I do, I'm just going to say, I'm doing this for Jesus. We should do that. That gives glory to God. But it's more than that. It's about making sure that everything we do is for the purpose of knowing Jesus more. Everything we do needs to be for the purpose of knowing Jesus. Jesus more. And it, when that's true, our paths will be straight because we'll be following Jesus and no matter where he leads, that is the right path to be on. Even if it's not a fun path, even if we don't understand the path, don't lean on our own understanding, but lean into him, trust in him. Hebrews chapter 11 is where we're going to go here. And I'm not going to read the whole chapter, although we could. Uh, Hebrews chapter 11 and Hebrews chapter 12, but Let's first of all look at a couple of phrases in in Hebrews 11, 1 through 3, and verse 6. It says, Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. For by it the people of old received their commendation. By faith we understand that the universe was created by the word of God, so that what is seen was not made out of things that are visible. And without faith it is impossible to please him, in verse 6. For whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. Faith and trust. They're the same thing. As we trust God in the fact that He is the Creator, that He is the one sustaining this world, that He has made all things, and therefore, to please God is to trust Him because we need to trust a couple of things. That He exists, that He's there, that He's real, that He really cares. And that's the other part, is that He really cares about those who seek Him. Here's this word about seeking again. If we seek Him, He's going to reward us. Not with temporary earthly rewards. You're going to hear me say that over and over and over again. What we are not saying today and is that if you just follow God, that your life is going to be easy and breezy and you're going to have all the money and all the wealth and all the, everything you could ever want for all of your life. That's not necessarily what we're saying. We're saying we're, you're going to receive what you need even if you don't know what you need. But those who seek Him will be rewarded. Then it goes on through Hebrews chapter 11, if you know the chapter. It lists all the people in the Old Testament who showed faith in God. And it basically ends up saying, listen, all these people had faith in God and they never really saw the end of their faith. They didn't see Jesus. They didn't see everything come to fruition the way it was supposed to come. And yet they trusted God anyway. That's the whole point of Hebrews chapter 11. And it talks about the idea that they trusted God on the path that they had even though they couldn't see the end. But then, in Hebrews chapter 12, after all of those people are referenced, and some of those people, by the way, were murdered, some of them were persecuted, some of them were were stripped away from family. The worst things you could imagine happened to some of these people who are following God and trusting in his path, even in death. 
So that was all happening. And then in Hebrews chapter 12, that's where now we're given the instructions and what we should learn from those people. Hebrews 12, 1 and 2. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. So how does this reply to what we've been looking at in Proverbs chapter 3? Well, we've seen that faith is what we need to have, and as we have that faith, as Hebrews 12 reminds us then, what that faith looks like is we look to Jesus. We're on a race. And as you're on a race, you need to know the goal. Because if you're looking at something else, you're going to run the wrong way. And the idea is you look to Jesus, because he's the author and perfecter of our faith. <clears throat> we run to him. And therefore, whatever path <coughs> we have to go through, whatever obstacles we may have to leap over or crawl under or whatever it takes, we're going to go straight towards Jesus because he is our goal. And that is the point of Hebrews 12, and I believe that's the point of Proverbs 3. Trust in the Lord, and he will make straight your paths. Not that he'll make everything easy, but he'll give you the right direction to go. You will be going towards the right journey. You'll go towards the right destination on the journey because you'll be looking to Jesus. That is the point in Hebrews chapter 12. So trusting in God leads to straight paths. Let's look at our next point as we go on to the next two verses in Proverbs 3. It's connected with 5 and 6, but it says this, Do not be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and turn away from evil. It will be healing to your flesh and refreshment to your bones. All right, so this, how many people want to experience healing and refreshment? I'm, just, I, if I, I'm not going to do a show of hands, but many of you would love to have healing and refreshment in your life. Maybe physical healing, maybe, uh, maybe it's not. Maybe it's emotional healing, maybe it's something else, but we want refreshment, we want to feel refreshed, we want to feel rested. How many times do we just say, if I could just be more rested, if I could just have more refreshment in my life, then I would feel better. I'd be able to walk this life better. And what, what this tells us in Proverbs and what the New Testament's going to say, you want to find healing and refreshment, it only comes through Jesus. It only comes through God. And our next point is this. Following God leads to refreshment. If you want to truly experience refreshment, rest, relaxation, and the, the knowledge that you are being healed in so many different ways, it's only going to come as we don't trust in ourselves, but instead trust in God. Don't trust in our own wisdom, right? We think that we can be wise in our own eyes, thinking that we can figure out how to get what we want. I think this is kind of right in the middle of, of these verses, and it kind of brings us all together. When we seek things, we tend to want to seek them in a way that we think is right. So if I want money, that means I'm going to be a workaholic and I'm going to do whatever I can to get money. Or I'm going to play the lottery every single day and buy 10,000 tickets every, every week. You know, we, we try to do whatever we're going to do. So I, need to, I want this and so I'm going to seek this. I feel like I need more rest, so I'm just going to you know, quit my job so I can sleep all day. Right? We think that maybe that's the wisdom that we need. We can figure these things out on our own. But that's not how we find what we truly want what we truly need. We need to find it in Christ, in God, not in our own eyes. That's why we fear, that's why we fear the Lord. And if we, start, if we start to go think ways of in our own eyes, it's only going to lead towards sin and evil. That's what we're told here. Don't be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord. Turn away from evil. Fearing the Lord is turning away from evil and turning towards Him. It's a lifestyle of repentance. And so we will live a lifestyle of repentance and then we will have refreshment and healing. Again, this does not mean that if you have a physical problem that you're going to be healed simply because you, uh, that you follow God's ways. There's still going to be physical problems that we are going to experience. There's going to be even emotional problems. We are living in a world of sin. And there will be consequences to all of that sin. But in the midst of all of it, we know that we can have true refreshment. That we can have true healing through Jesus. That no matter how we feel in this life, that the truth is, that he is the one we can run to to find full refreshment and full healing. And, and that's even seen in James chapter 1. We've preached on James, so I'm not going to talk about this too much. A little bit of a long passage, but James 1, 2 through 18. I'll just draw your attention to a few things as we read. James 1, 2 through 18. Count it all joy. There we go. That's joy. That's refreshment. That is knowing that, that you are being healed by God. All that joy comes. Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of many kinds, knowing that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness and let steadfastness have its full effect 
you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. Lacking in nothing, that means full refreshment. You have everything you need. Going on, if any of you lacks wisdom, this is where James is talking about wisdom, let him ask God who gives generously. So if you ask for wisdom, he's going to give it to you. That is the refreshment that you need, and it will be given to him. But let him ask in faith with no doubting, for the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea that is driven and tossed by the wind. For that person must not suppose they will receive anything from the Lord. He is a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. Let the lowly brother boast in his exaltation. There we get to be exalted by God. That is the greatest refreshment we can find and healing we can find. And the rich in his humiliation, because like a flower of the grass he will pass away. For the sun rises with its scorching heat and withers the grass. Its flower falls, its beauty perishes. So also will the rich man fade away in the midst of his pursuits. Blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial. That word blessed, again, is that joyful, filled fulfillment of being happy in Christ. Blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial, for when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life, which God has promised to those who give him. Let no one say when he is tempted, I am tempted by God, for God cannot be tempted with evil. This is where we don't follow evil ways, and he himself tempts no one. But each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. When desire is conceived, it gives birth to sin, and when sin, when it is fully grown, brings forth death. Do not be deceived, my beloved brothers. And this is where we all come to. So we, we don't, God does not give us the desire to sin. Okay, what happens is very clear in verse 17. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. Of his own will he brought us forth by the word of truth that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. Let's boil this down to say James is very clear says that God wants to give good things to his children. He doesn't give bad things. He doesn't give sinful desires. He gives us every good thing. He gives us refreshment. He gives us healing. He doesn't give us the opposite of that. That is what James is very clear of. Now there's going to be a little piece that we're going to look at at the end of this Proverbs that's going to have to rearrange how we think about hardship in our life. But understanding that God is not out to hurt us is really the point here. God is not out to hurt us. He's here to help us. Because he loves us, and he cares for us, and he's giving us grace. So let's move on as we continue on in Proverbs 3. 9 and 10 is where we're next. Honor the Lord with your wealth and with the first fruits of all your produce. Then your barns will be filled with plenty, and your vats be bursting with wine. All right, point five. Honoring God with wealth leads to abundance. Here's where we have to be careful. This is not a... Prosperity gospel that we are preaching as we go to Proverbs to say simply, if you give, if you give me ten dollars today, then tomorrow you're going to have ten thousand. That is not the promise that is being made here. The rest of Scripture is very clear what abundance looks like, and it's not in material things and in our physical wealth. But here we need to understand a point, as he does say in Proverbs, that the Lord expects us, God, Yahweh Himself, expects us. To honor him with everything he's given us, with the first fruits of our produce. In other words, that we give him the best, not just the leftovers. We give him the best of our money, we give him the best of our time, we give him the best of our lives, because that's what he deserves. I think a lot of us, whether it's talking about money or our time or how we serve, ends up giving what's ever left over. Like, okay, well, now that I have, oh, I have a little bit left, I'll give that to God. That's not what we're expected to do. Wisdom says God has given us all things. So therefore, wisdom says we give God our very best. Don't just save the leftovers for him, but give him your very, very best. And if that happens, we're told that we will have plenty and our vats will be bursting with wine. Obviously, this is a metaphor to the idea that we will live a fulfilled and completed life, an abundant life. Jesus himself said he came to give what? An abundance of life. And that is the understanding that we, under, that we see, even as we now go to the New Testament in another passage, which Pastor Justin has already brought up a few weeks ago. But let's look at this again in 2 Corinthians 9, 6 through 9. The point is this. Whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and whoever sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. Each one must give as he has decided in his own heart, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to make all grace abound to you, so that having all sufficiency in all things at all times, you may abound in every good work. As it is written, he has distributed freely, he has given to the poor, his righteousness endures 
forever. 2 Corinthians 9, 6 through 9 says, Be a cheerful giver. That's what God wants. We've already talked about what it looks like to give. And as we give, as we give our best, what are we told that God will do? He is able to make all grace. Watch the all word here. All grace, so that having all sufficiency in all things at all times, you may abound in every good work. Is there any question here that God is going to supply anything and everything we will ever need? The Bible is clear that if we give to Him, He has already given to us. He is a gracious God that will give us everything we could ever want and ever need. Again, but we've got to get our minds set to what that is. And all we really want and need is Jesus Himself, but He will give us fulfillment. He will give us abundance in a way that the world could never give it to us. Abundance in a way that no amount of money you could ever feel like you have. Abundance in a way that no matter how many possessions or how much wealth you accumulate in this world will mean nothing compared to knowing Jesus and living with Him forever. And we have all that grace, all that unmerited favor poured upon us. And all God says here is, just be willing to give. Give your best. And you will see the grace of God come flowing through your life. And that is what we see in our, in our fifth point. Honoring God with wealth leads to abundance. And I would just say, honoring God with whatever He has given you will allow you to see God's great grace in your life that you'll have everything you could ever dream of in a way that we may not even understand. But He gives us all things, all the time. Finally, point six, and this is interesting that it's given in here in Proverbs 3. But it's a reminder that life is not always going to go the way we want it to. That life is not always going to be easy. That life is not always going to be comfortable. That life sometimes is going to hurt. But even in the midst of that, we're told some truth that we need to cling to today. Proverbs 3, 11 and 12. My son, do not despise the Lord's discipline or be weary of his reproof. For the Lord reproves him whom he loves as a father, the son in whom he delights. So as we look at this, we see that being disciplined by God leads to delight. Now, the rest of these things are things that we kind of do, right? We, we, we know that God gives us the strength to do them, but we do them. But in point six here, it's something that is done to us. Something outside of our control completely. And that is that sometimes in life, God is going to discipline and reprove us for the times that we don't live wise lives for the times that we walk away from Him, for the times we don't follow Jesus the way we do, honestly, for the times that we don't listen, for the times we're not committed, for the times we don't trust Him, for the times we don't follow Him, for the times we don't honor Him with our wealth, then God may bring discipline. And He may bring hard times. But here's the promise in all of this, that at the end of His discipline is a God who delights in us. Now I say here, being disciplined by God leads to delight. Now in this passage it says that He is the one who delights in us. And that is true. He shows favor to us. That's the idea of delight. It's to demonstrate His favor towards us. However, as He delights in us, the rest of the Scripture makes it very clear that we also can delight in Him as our Father. How many of us are seeking love? Probably the greatest seek seeking thing that we see in this world sought after thing we see it you turn on your tv read a book look around watch the news everyone wants to be loved everyone wants to have a relationship that matters and that's why we see people who are trying to find that in every way possible by putting themselves out online as much as they can to try to find someone who will love them by seeking for favor and seeking uh love from all sorts of places that they never should and in some cases have given their lives up just to find that special someone or to find that love that they so desperately need because we are built for relationship everyone is looking for that relationship and we have it in God and we see that through his discipline and that's the part we need to focus in on we can have delight because we know he loves us because he disciplines us he doesn't just let us go and do whatever we want and destroy our lives you know, an unloving father would do that with his kids. Oh, you want to go play in the snake pit? Go ahead, have fun. Like, that would be the worst father ever. That would be terrible. No, the father is going to watch out for his kids and if need, if need be, <clears throat> grab that kid, 
squeeze him really hard and run away from him, drag him behind him, getting all the bruises and bumps on the way to get him away from the snake pit. But the point is, I don't know why I picked snake pit, because I don't like snakes, but whatever, whatever the case is, I don't know, that was random. But the point is, is a good father is not going to just let his kids do whatever they want, consequences, whatever, doesn't matter. They're going to protect their, ch- their child, and sometimes that comes in, in discipline. It comes through pain. It comes through smacking the hand away from the fire. It comes through whatever you need to do, and God is going to discipline. He's going to cause pain to come into our lives, not to hurt us, but to help us. Any good father knows that good discipline means that you are looking out for your child, and even if it causes some pain temporarily, it's to spare them from even greater pain. And that's what God is doing as he disciplines us. He disciplines and reproves us in the times we need it, and it's not even always just the times that we do something bad and need to be corrected. It's also the times that he just needs to remind us to stay on the path. I think about the shepherd analogy. Sometimes the, the sheep needs to be like kind of whacked a little bit to get back in line. The sheep might not, even go in to, might not be going towards the cliff at that point, but it needs to be reminded where it needs to be going. But the idea here is for us is that God will discipline us and train us and sometimes that will bring pain and as it does we need to trust him because he is our father who loves us and who delights in us. Hebrews chapter 12 in the New Testament talks about this really is a New Testament uh, cross reference of Proverbs chapter 3 here. Hebrews 12, 3 through 13. Let's read that. This is right after the verses that I just read about putting our focus on Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. It says this, Consider him who endured from sinners such hostility against himself, that you may not grow weary or faint-hearted. In your struggle against sin, you have not yet resisted to the point of shedding your blood. And have you forgotten the exhortation that he addresses you as sons? My son, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, nor be weary when reproved by him. That should sound familiar. For the Lord disciplines the one he loves and chastises every son whom he receives. It is for discipline that you have to endure. God is treating you as sons. For what son is there whom his father does not discipline? If you are left without discipline in which all have participated, then you are illegitimate sons, children, and not sons. Besides this, we have had earthly fathers who disciplined us as we, and we respected them. Shall we not much more be subject to the father of spirits and live? For they disciplined us for a short time and it seemed, as it seemed best to them, but he disciplines us for our good that we may share in his holiness for the moment all discipline seems painful rather than pleasant but later it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it so what we see here is very clear in the times that god brings pain into our lives which will happen it might be happening to you right now it's to it's to get you back to looking to jesus it's to get you back to look to him because he delights in you and he loves you and he is seeing you as a son. This is for those who know Jesus. This is for those who have responded to the gospel. This is for those who have said, I believe the fact that I am a sinner that was in desperate and is in desperate need of a Savior. And I know that that Savior is Jesus, that he died on the cross, that he rose again, that he's coming back again. And I trust and believe in him and I'm repenting and turning away from living my way and choosing to live for him. That is for anyone who has given their life to Jesus, who has believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, who has repented towards him. Anyone who has done that, that is the person we're talking about who will, even in the painful times of life, it'll be for their good. That, he may, that we may share in his holiness, that we may be more like him, so that we may have the peaceful fruit of righteousness, so that good things will happen in our lives as it relates to how we live a life that is godly and holy unto Him. God would not do this if He didn't love us. That's the point. God does this because of His love. A good father will discipline not out of hatred or anger. A good father will discipline out of love for the betterment of the child. And that's what God promises to those who follow Him, to those who listen to Him, to those who will listen to wisdom. He says, no matter the pain that might come, it's for your good. We know that to be true. So as we looked at Proverbs chapter 3, we looked at a lot of verses in the New Testament. Let's bring it all back around as we conclude. Remember the question we started with was, what do you seek? What are you seeking today? It's probably one of these, but maybe it's something else. But let's just look at them and 
talk about it for just a moment. What are you seeking? Is it peace? Is life right now feeling broken and shattered? You don't know which way is up. You're, you don't feel like your life is full in any way, shape, or form. You just feel lost. Do you want peace? Don't look to the world to find it. Look to Jesus. It's found in Jesus, so listen to him. If you want peace, true fulfillment, where life makes sense, it's found in Jesus and only Jesus. It's not found in anything the world has to offer. So find peace in him. Are you seeking success? Do you just find yourself wanting to be the best? Do you want to, do you want to see yourself live a successful life? First of all, redefine success the way God does. Faithfulness to him in a life that means something towards him. And again, it's found in Jesus. So commit to him. Committing your life to Jesus is where only re, the only true success will be found. Committing yourself to the workplace. Committing yourself to whatever your endeavors are so that you will be successful. You can commit yourself 100% to those things and it'll, they'll still let you down. Commit yourself to Jesus. He won't let you down. Be committed to him and you'll find true and lasting success. Are you looking for guidance? Just not sure which way to go. You're, you're feeling lost and wandering. Then where do we find guidance? Well, it's not through help, self-help books. It's not through going to the world to ask for their opinion. It's found in Jesus. So trust in Him. Trust in His Word. Trust in who He is. Trust in Him and know that wherever you go, that He is the one that is leading you. And you won't feel lost anymore. You'll know that you're going in the right way. Even if you might still be confused at times of where you're going or why you're going there, you'll know that you're following Jesus and He is the one that we can trust. Don't trust in your own wisdom, but trust in Him. Are you looking for refreshment? Are you just feeling weighed down by life? Life is hard. It is. It always will be hard. You're not going to find refreshment through what the world says you can find refreshment in. Whether that's uh, going out and, make, and finding some substance that will make you feel better. Whether it's uh, going out and, and living for something that you feel like is going to give you refreshment. That maybe if I just change this or change that or do this or do that, then maybe I can find refreshment. Well, any life changes you make will leave you short. Jesus, though, will give you true refreshment. So follow Him. Follow Jesus and His ways. This is the idea of Proverbs 3. Follow wisdom. Follow Jesus. And you will find peace, success, guidance, refreshment. Also, wealth. Are you finding yourself just seeking to be wealthy. First of all, I would challenge you to understand what true wealth is all about. It's not being rich in this world, but it's being rich towards God in your relationship with Him. And if you want to find true wealth that will always last, whereas wealth of this world will, will rot and destroy, as Jesus tells us, following Jesus and seeking after Him, that is the wealth that all of us can have, and it's the wealth that will never leave. It's found in Jesus, so honor Him. So honor Him with the wealth you have. With the physical wealth, the spiritual wealth, all the wealth you may have, honor Him because it's only through honoring Him with your wealth that you will experience true fulfillment in life. And finally, relationship. We've talked about this. Do you desire, are you seeking a relationship? Are you looking for love in any place you can find it? Whether it's from, uh, whether it's from a family member, whether it's from a friend, whether it's to find that special someone, whatever, wherever you might be, are you looking for a relationship that you feel that will fulfill you. No earthly relationship. And I'm saying this as a man who loves my wife, loves my kids, has a lot of really good friends that I can honestly say I love. None of those relationships are anything, will ever fulfill anything in my life other than a relationship with Jesus. It's found in Him. We need to know Jesus. We need to look to Him, listen to Him, Love Him. Trust Him. All of these things I'll point us to if you want a relationship with the Father God who loves you dearly, who delights in you, then you will also love and delight in Him. That is the only relationship that will ever fulfill you. Don't believe the lies of this world. Keep in mind, we're talking about wisdom. The world says wisdom looks like finding all of these things in whatever way it takes for us to find it. But the truth of wisdom is it's only found in Jesus. Only found in in him and with that i'm gonna call the worship team up i know it's 11 10 we're right on that limit but i love this last song we're gonna sing so if the worship team could come forward as i kind of finish us 
we look at this conclusion, we look at Proverbs chapter 3. As we look at Proverbs chapter 3, we see that there is true wisdom and there is promises that come with the wisdom that we live by. Following Jesus does result.